Hello citizens of the internet. Today I am going to discuss spontaneous preterm labor. Despite considerable advances in obstetric care, preterm labor continues to be a major cause of perinatal mortality and morbidity. Preterm labor is not only a medical and social problem but in many cases it is also an economic one. This is part 1 of my e-lecture on spontaneous preterm labor. In part 2 I will discuss the management of spontaneous preterm labor. To know what is preterm delivery, one must know what is term delivery. Delivery that occurs between 37 completed weeks and 42 completed weeks is referred to as term delivery. Any delivery that takes place after 42 weeks is called post term delivery. Therefore, any birth occurring between viability that is 20 or 24 weeks and 37 completed gestational weeks is called preterm birth. Loss of pregnancy prior to 20 completed weeks is termed as miscarriage or abortion. The onset of uterine contractions of sufficient intensity to cause progressive effacement and or dilatation of cervix between 20 and 37 completed weeks of gestation is called preterm labor please note that the onset of uterine contractions without any cervical changes is called preterm contractions or threatened preterm labor preterm birth is further divided into late preterm birth that occurs between 34 to 37 completed weeks early preterm birth between 32 to 34 weeks very preterm birth between 28 to 32 weeks and delivery that occurs prior to 28 weeks is called as extreme preterm birth preterm labor complicates 5 to 11% of pregnancies because uncertainties still persist regarding its prevention and effective management the incidence of preterm labor has changed very little over the last 40 years about half of these that is 40 to 50% occur spontaneously whereas 25% occur following preterm pre labor rupture of membranes and iatrogenic preterm labor due to obstetric intervention accounts for the remaining 25% preterm birth is associated with profound risk to the fetus born preterm birth is a major cause of perinatal mortality contributing around 36% of infant deaths infants born preterm are also at increased risk of immediate risk such as birth trauma hypothermia respiratory distress syndrome and long term sequelae such as chronic lung disease retinopathy of prematurity neurological impairments such as developmental delay cerebral palsy mental retardation blindness and deafness it is important to identify high risk factors that may help us to predict the onset of preterm labor so that measures could be taken to prevent its occurrence these are prior preterm labor A previous history of preterm labor is the strongest risk marker. It has been estimated that the incidence of preterm labor in subsequent pregnancies after one preterm birth rises to 14.3% and after two preterm births to 28% and after three preterm births it is as high as 70%. Other risk factors that reportedly increase the risk of preterm labor include poor socioeconomic or educational status multiple pregnancy cigarette smoking cervical incompetence or uterine anomalies uterine overdistension such as polyhydramnios macrosomia or fibroids previous cervical surgery tobacco chewing bleeding in early pregnancy bacterial vaginosis severe periodontal disease medical termination of pregnancy short interval between pregnancy that is less than 12 months and young or advanced maternal age 
the pathophysiology of preterm birth is innately complex and incompletely understood. Several genetic, physiological and environmental factors are associated with preterm birth and contribute to uterine activation, labor and untimely birth. Proposed pathophysiological pathways leading to preterm birth is shown in the diagram. For lack of time, I am not going into details of the same. It should be noted that local inflammatory response is an important underlying pathophysiological factor in spontaneous preterm labor. Now I will tell you why it is worthwhile in spontaneous preterm labor to delay the pregnancy for as long as possible. One should bear in mind that each day of delay between 22 to 28 weeks of gestation increases fetal survival by 3% without the need to go to full term. This graph shows fetal mortality versus gestational age. If delivery occurs at 24 weeks, 80% of the fetuses will perish. Delay the pregnancy by just 2 weeks more and one can cut the fetal mortality rate by half. As an approximation, just remember that for every 2 weeks delay in gestational age, one can cut the perinatal mortality by half. It is now possible to predict whether a patient with preterm uterine contractions will go into spontaneous preterm labor. In modern obstetrics, two parameters are used for prediction, cervical length and fetal fibronectin. One of the earliest indicators of cervical incompetency or onset of labor is shortening of the cervix. Cervical length assessed by transvaginal ultrasonography seems to have a significant predictive value in preterm labor. There is evidence to show that the shorter the cervix, the higher the risk of preterm labor. This study by Goldenberg et al. shows probability of delivery before 32 weeks based on cervical length before 24 weeks. When cervical length at 24 weeks was greater than 3 cm, the incidence of preterm labor was 5%. When it was between 2 to 3 cm, it rose to 10%, and when the cervix was less than 1.9 cm, it was significantly high at 20%. Based on this study, we use this triage for prediction of preterm labor. If on transvaginal sonography, cervical length is greater than 3 cm, the risk is so low that it almost excludes the diagnosis of preterm labor. With a cervical length of 2 to 3 cm, the risk of preterm labor is said to be increased. When cervical length is less than 2 cm, it increases the risk significantly and such patients must be admitted for further evaluation and treatment. Cervical length assessment using transvaginal ultrasound between 24 to 28 weeks may have a place in pregnancies that are at high risk for preterm labor. Oncofetal fibronectin is a basement membrane protein, extracellular glycoprotein, a glue-like substance found in the fetal membranes, decidua and amniotic fluid, which is produced by the fetal membranes and functions as an adhesion binder. It is detectable in cervical secretions until 16 to 20 weeks of gestation. After that, it disappears only to reappear shortly before the onset of labor. Appearance of fetal fibronectin in cervical secretions after 24 weeks of gestation in concentrations exceeding 50 nanograms per ml may indicate detachment of the fetal membranes from the decidua. Fetal fibronectin test has a very high negative predictive value. If negative, the risk of delivering in the upcoming two weeks is less than 1%. However, it has a relatively low positive predictive value. If positive, the risk of delivering in one week is only 18%. It can be recommended in high-risk women who fulfill the criteria of intact membranes 
minimal cervical dilatation that is less than 3 cm and gestational age between 24 to 34 weeks other predictive markers of preterm labor used are phosphorylated insulin like growth factor binding protein 1 which is also known as actin partum test and salivary estriol levels fetal fibronectin test combined with transvaginal ultrasound for cervical length assessment is better than either test alone in identifying high risk women who will ultimately experience preterm delivery the use of fetal fibronectin testing and transvaginal sonography for cervical length assessment has been associated with a reduction in hospital admissions length of hospital stay and overall hospital costs in the management of spontaneous preterm labor the diagnosis of spontaneous preterm labor on clinical grounds should include the following uterine contractions that are painful palpable last longer than 30 seconds and occur at least 4 times per 20 minutes or 8 times in 60 minutes cervical dilatation greater than 1 cm or cervical effacement of 80% or greater the frequency of uterine contractions does not matter if the cervix is greater than 3 cm dilated in primary cavity or more than 4 cm in multipara and or greater than 80% efface and or membranes are ruptured following investigations must be done in a case of spontaneous preterm labor ultrasonography to confirm fetal maturity to rule out congenital malformations placenta previa intrauterine fetal death abrupt show placenta diagnosis of malpresentation measurement of amniotic fluid index intrauterine fetal breathing movements cervical length must also be measured erector vaginal culture for group b streptococcus urine analysis and culture to evaluate for evidence of urinary tract infection or asymptomatic bacteriuria wet mount of vaginal secretions to rule out bacterial vaginosis or trichomonas vaginitis furning test or ph of vaginal secretions to rule out premature rupture of membranes investigations for predisposing factors such as preeclampsia must also be done for further reading on this topic and other topics in obstetrics and gynecology refer to following books written by me practical obstetrics and gynecology modern obstetrics modern gynecology clinical cases in obstetrics questions and answers clinical cases in gynecology questions and answers and pelvic reconstructive surgery If you have found this video useful and informative please subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking here